Um, today, I'm also st still continuing the David story, but here it will be more concentrated on Saul. And the topic is jealousy and some lessons from Saul. And we will take it from First Samuel, from chapter 18, um, normally chapter 18 and 19 mainly. So let's look at First Samuel chapter 18 from verse 6 and see um, what we have. And it came to pass, as they came, when David was returned from the slaughter of the Philistine, that the woman came out of all cities of Israel singing and dancing to meet him, to meet King Saul with tablet, with joy, and with ins instruments of music. Let's go to the next verse, please. And the woman answered, one another as they played and said Saul has slain his thousands and David has slain his ten thousands and Saul was very rough and the sayings displaced him and he said they have ascribed unto David ten thousand and, unto, and, and to me they have ascribed but thousand and what can he have but that of the kingdom let's move to the next verse please and so I, David, from that day and forward. And it came to pass on the morrow that the evil spirit from the Lord came upon Saul. And he prophesied in the midst. Um, I think you move away from where I am, right? Which verse is this? 1820. Okay, that is fine. And it came to pass. And it came to pass on the morrow that the evil spirit from God came upon Saul, and he prophesied in the midst of the house. And David played with his hand as the other times, and there was a javelin in Saul's hand. Let's move to the next verse. And Saul cast the javelin, for he said, I will smite David, even to the war with it. And David avoided out of his presence twice. Okay, let's go to keep on. Well, and Saul was afraid of David because the Lord was with him and had departed from Saul. So the team also keeps on coming. The Lord was with him. So the success of David, we should all bear in mind like previously, he was successful because the Lord was with him. And we Christians, we should know that the Lord is with us. If you are saved, the Holy Spirit dwells in you, so the Lord is with us. And Saul so was afraid of David, because the Lord was with him, and was departed from Saul. Let's go to the next verse, please. Therefore Saul removed him from he removed him from him and made him the captain of a thousand. And he went out and came in before the people. Let's go to the next verse. And David behaved himself wisely in all his ways, and the Lord was with him. Again, the team is coming up over and over. Let's go to the next verse. 16. Wherefore, when Saul saw that he behaved himself very wisely, he was afraid of him. So here, what we see is, after Saul, um, David has killed Goliath, and then they pursued the Philistines and succeeded. When they were coming back, um, the woman came around singing. And this was typical for the Israelites. Whenever they had victory, there was a sort of a celebration. The women would meet the soldiers when they are coming, and they would sing and praise God. Um, if we go into Moses' time, that was happened in Exodus. That he said, Miriam sang to them, sing to the Lord. For he has triumphed gloriously, the horse and the rider he has thrown into the sea. That is when the Egyptians were drowned. And if we go in further on, um, when Jephthah defeated um, the Ammonites, the same thing. Her daughter came with singing and tambourine, trying to meet the soldiers. And unfortunately, um, Jephthah have made a promise to God that a person who meets 
him who would dedicate that person to the Lord. And I mean, that was a sad story in that sense. A joyous occasion became um, something not all that pleasant. So that singing is nothing new. It was something they used to do whenever there's victory. But here, what happened? Instead of Saul rejoicing with David and the victory that they have had, he became jealous because the women were singing that Saul has killed his thousand and David his ten thousand. The victory that God gave to the Israelites I mean, in Paul's um, Saul's side was not considered. He was rather more concerned that popularity was going to David than to him, so he became jealous. He was self-centered, and this is something that we should avoid, that when, as Christians, our fellow Christians, or even non-Christians, when they succeed, we should rejoice with them instead of being envious. That is something which Saul did, what would have happened if he had rejoiced with David and had helped him throughout? But he did not do that. And the problem with jealousy is, as we will see, it led Paul to what I would call a rabbit hole. He continued trying all schemes. Saul was trying all schemes to kill David. So he allowed jealousy to overcome him. And then he wasted no time um, thinking that David who become the next king, so he wanted to kill David. So he tried. Um, we know that the evil spirit from the Lord has come upon Saul. So when David was playing the harp in front of him, what did he do? He tried to kill David. He tried to pin him down. But David dodged twice. Um, it's remarkable that David will remain in front of Saul after the first attempt and still stay there and then be playing the, the, I mean, the harp. I would have run away immediately. I wouldn't have stayed there. <laughs> but he stayed. And that shows the commitment of David to his job. And that is a lesson that we should learn that um, whenever God has put us and we are working, we should put in our all to glorify God. I um, must the word of God that every, whether you eat or drink, do it all to the glory of God. And he is not only eating and drinking in our jobs, and in all occasions, whatever we have, let us put our, um, our best in. Even in the face of danger, David did not just run away. It happened twice before he moved on. But why was Saul doing this? It's because of jealousy and envy of David. That David was more successful than him, and God was with him, and God has left him. What would have happened if Saul had prayed to God and asked for mercy like Hezekiah did when they said he was going to die? Probably God would have spared him all this, but he didn't do that. All that he was interested in is that he wanted to kill David. And for Christians also we should know that as Saul was afraid of David, because the Lord was with him, our enemies are also afraid of us because the Lord is with us. That's that we have to be cognizant that God is with us and not be afraid, knowing that he has our back in all cases. So, um, like Proverb, it was said that even God can make our enemies be at peace with us. So when God is with us, our enemies are afraid of us, and with the help of God, even they will be at peace with us, they will eventually give up. So Saul might have been worried um, that the Spirit of God has departed from him and he has gone to David. So what did he do next? The next thing was, let me get this David out of my sight. If I couldn't kill him, I'm going to use another tact. So what did he do? I would say he demoted him, but he made him a commander of a thousand, and that was, he made him a military commander, so he has to go on skirmishes. And what was his intention? If I can't kill him, let the Philistines do the job for me. So David was supposed to go in and out 
to war and then leading instead of being in the royal palace and helping the king recover from his sickness he said no i just want this guy dead because he's more popular than me now like he was jealous of him so david also took the job and he went in and out unfortunately for saul that guy was successful and he was becoming more popular because everybody started liking him um, all the ventures that he embark on he succeeded so and why because of divine assistance because of god assistance so we should always see god help in everything we do um there that is where victory comes if we do that and when that happens what was saul's attitude now he became more afraid of david and instead of repenting and being at peace he started devising more schemes um, so let's look at verse 17 and Saul so said to David behold my elder daughter Merab here will I give thee to wife only be thou valiant for me and fight the Lord's battle. For Saul said, Let not my hand be upon him, but let the hand of the Philistines be upon him. So he wasn't satisfied in making him commander. He wanted to push him more and more um, to fight so that he dies. So he said, I'm going to give my daughter to you as a wife. But remember that the promise that um, Saul gave that the person who ever killed Goliath was going to give the elder daughter to the person. David had already done that, so it means he had already paid the price, but he had not given the daughter to David. Now he came again and said, oh, just go and do battle for me, and when you do that, I'll give you my daughter. And let's go to the next verse, and it says, and David said unto Saul, who am I? And what is my life for my father's family in Israel, that I should be the son in law of the king? Let's go to the next verse. Okay, so here David complained, like more or less, hey, you know what? I'm from a poor family, my parents are nothing. And during the society, also, there was sort of this elitism in their society. So David thought, there's no way that the king is going to give the daughter to me. He's already promised the first one. He didn't do it. So this, this one, so he told the king, I'm from a poor family. Hey, and making it worse for David, he had the Moabite blood. If you remember the story of Naomi. So he's not pure, more or less. So in the other side. So he thought it was impossible. But then... He continued to do whatever the king told him that he was doing the battle for him. But the next verse says, But it came to pass at a time when Merab, Saul's daughter, should have been given to David, that he was given unto Adriel. The what, what is the name? The light here. The home, my light. To, to wife. Okay. Um, <laughs> okay, so the deceit came in. You promised me that I should spend, I'll risk my life for this lady. I've done all that, and then you're giving the daughter to somebody else. But because really, the intention of Saul was not to give the daughter. His intention was to get David killed. That is because he was so jealous of him, and that is what jealousy can do. But as we have it. The Merab had five sons, but eventually they were killed. Um, if I should read there, here, I didn't give it to you guys, so I read it from here. Now, when David was king, and because of what Saul did, he was supposed to spare um, the Amorites. Because you know that, is it the Amorites? Yeah, the Amorites. Yeah, the Gibeonites was the clan at that time, but the Amorites, Joshua made a pact with them when they entered the 
promised land and they came in some tattered clothes and then some bread and told them that they came from far away <laughs> and they made a pact with them and when they did that they revealed that oh, we are just staying with the people but the part was God takes our words very important that's why Jesus says let our yes be yes and our no be no so those guys there was a treaty if I can say that that they are not going to kill them they were just going to make them save them but here we say that now there was famine in the days of David for three years and David sought the face of the Lord and the Lord said there is a blood guilt on Saul and his house because he put the Gibeonites to death so this is where God said there was a famine and David was king at that time so he was asking God what is the problem why do are we suffering like this? And God said that there's something that you need to take care of. The blood of some people are crying to me like the, the blood of Abel. So David called the Gibeonites and spoke to them. Now the Gibeonites were of the people of Israel, but of the remnant of Amorites. They were not of the people of Israel, but the remnant of Amorites. Although the people of Israel had sworn to spare them, so... So had sought to strike them down in his zeal for the people of Israel and Judah. And David said to the Gibeonites, What shall I do for you? And how shall I make atonement that you may bless the heritage of the Lord? So more or less, this tells us that they were cursing Israel for what they had done. They didn't keep it to their word. The Gibeonites said to him, it is not a matter of silver and gold between us and Saul or his house. Neither is it for us to put any man to death in Israel. So here they said that we, are, we, we don't want money and we really don't want to kill anybody. But David persisted. And he said, what do you say that I should do for you? And they said to the king, the man who consumed us and planned to destroy us. So that we will not have a place in all of the territory of Israel, lest seven of his sons be given to us, so that we may hang them before the Lord that give you of Saul, the chosen of the Lord. And the king said, I'll give them. So this is where God even saved David from this. If this did not come up, and if David had children of the Merab, what would have happened? He would have had to give the children to be executed. And so when things happen to us, at times when it happens, we may say, why me and what sort of thing? But the word of God says we should give thanks to God in all things. Um, so because we don't know what could happen in the future if God allowed certain things to happen or not to happen in that sense. So here, but the king spared Mephishabeth, the son of Saul, uh, the son of Saul, son Jonathan, because of the oath of the Lord that he was between them, between David and Jonathan, the son of Saul, the king took the two sons of Rispa, the daughter of Ahia, whom he brought to Saul, Ammoni and Mephibosheth, and the five sons of Merab, the daughter of Saul, whom he brought to Adriel, the son of Bezelai, the Meholatite, and gave them unto the hands of the Gibeonites, and they hung them on the mountain before the Lord, and the seven of them perished together. So, you see, Saul thought he was hurting David, not knowing he was really sparing him. God was trying to spare David from marrying that daughter. Um, when we live in life, God expects us to be genuine, and he will take care of us if we are children of God. He says he will direct our steps. So in all things, we should give thanks. And as we do that, some of them may be painful at that time. Um, but if we don't revenge, if we pull back, knowing that God is in control, that as the word of God says, that all things work together for those who love God. If we know that, um, we should not be worried. We should thank God, pray for his help, and move on in life. There's one thing that we realize that David never said, why me? He just kept on doing his work as best as he could, and he was successful. So here, um, let's move to 
verse 20, if you can. Okay. Now Saul's daughter, 1820. Okay, it says, and Michael, Saul's, Michael, Saul's daughter, loved David. And they told Saul, and the thing placed him. Okay, let's move to the next verse. So another opportunity is coming um, for Saul. And Saul said, I will give him. I will give him her that she may be a snare to him and that the hand of the Philistines may be against him. Wherefore Saul said to David, Thou shalt this day be my son-in-law in one of the twin. So here it comes again that David, and not David, Saul had the news that the daughter is in love with David. So he said, okay, well, I have another chance. I can still carry out my plans. So now I'm going to give that daughter to, to David. I know that that daughter is bad. So when I give that daughter to David, it will be a snare to David. I will explain why he said that. And then second also, so it means I have two plans now. Either my daughter will mess up things for David, or David will still die, because I'm going to still demand that he goes to war. He be a patriot for me. And let's go to the next verse again. And Saul so commanded his servant, saying, Commune with David secretly. And say, Behold, the king of delight in thee, and all his servants love thee. Now therefore be the king's son-in-law. So now, knowing that Saul had failed once, or twice more or less, David was a little bit hesitant, although he knew that um, the daughter loved him. But he was hesitant, so what did Saul do? He told other guys, go and tell David that, yeah, you know, this girl loves you, and I like you so much that I want to give you my daughter. So, but he, the intention was still there. He was so jealous. The plan is all along, I want to kill this guy. That is all that I, I needed. So let's go to the next, next, next verse. And Saul said, man, speak those words into the ears of David. And David said, and David said, Cement it unto you, a light thing to be the king's son in law, seeing that I'm a poor man and lightly esteemed. That is why David is now elaborating that, hey, I'm from a poor family. Um, I'm a shepherd boy who has come here. You, want, you think the king is going to give me the daughter? I've done this thing twice and he didn't mind me. Now you think he's going to do it for me? You know that I have a Moabite blood. You see, I'm nobody in Israel. You don't guys don't regard me. So, why do you think the king would do that? Let's move to the next one, the next verse. And the servants of Saul told him, saying, On this manner speak David. Let's go on. And Saul said, Thus shall ye say to David, The king desireth not any die, but an hundred force king of the Philistines, to be avenged of the king's enemies. But Saul thought to make David fall by the hands of the Philistines. So look at what Saul is doing again. Jealousy, you see, he's getting him deeper and deeper. That, oh, okay, you, you see, I know we are nobody. I can't, you can't even afford it. I don't want anything from you. All that I want is just go and bring me um, the word they use nicely, hundred, four skins of hundred Philistines. But what they want is the penises of hundred Philistines. That's what I want. So what it means, he has to go and kill them and cut the genitals and bring to, uh, to Saul. And just look at what does he need that for. It's, it's, it's incredible, but that is what he said he wanted. And David decided, okay, I'm going to do it. Um, <laughs> so let, let's go to the next verse. And when his servants told David this word, it pleased David well, so to be the king's son-in-law, and the days were not expired. So what it means is even they gave him time for him to do it. Before that time, um, David went on, let's see the next verse. 
Wherefore David arose and went, he and his men, and slew of the Philistines two hundred men. And David brought their foreskins, and they gave them in the full tale to the king, that he might be the king's son-in-law. And Saul gave him Michal, his daughter, as a wife. So, when he wanted a hundred, and he gave him two hundred. And he did it in such a way that everybody saw it. So this time, there was no, no tricks. Saul had to give the daughter. So whatever was done, and he married the daughter. And Saul wasn't satisfied. If we go to verse 20, um, let's see here. Saul wasn't satisfied. He still, um, as we saw, he knew the daughter was going to entice David to sin. And that was very diabolical, what he was trying to do. Um, it is stated in a short form that he told the daughter who ensnare David. But the real thing that he wanted was, if we look at the ways that we use that as snare, and if you go to the later part of the Old Testament, it is a sort of um, enticement which come from idols. So maybe let's read the next verse and see what happened when David wanted to kill. Uh, Saul wanted to kill David. And Saul saw and knew that the Lord was with David and that Michal, Saul's daughter, loved him. Okay, let's move on. And Saul was yet the more afraid of David. And Saul became David's enemy continually. So now what he, David uh, Saul did was he was going in full swing. He wanted this guy, I'm going to kill him. Let, let's move on to the next verse. Then the princes of the Philistines went forth, and it came to pass after they went forth that David behaved himself more wisely than all the servants of Saul, so that his name was much said by. So what it means is he even became more popular. And everybody liked David now. So the plans of Saul, more or less, was failing in that sense. Um, so he became more wroth. Let's move to verse 19, uh, chapter 19, and verse 1. And Saul spoke to Jonathan, his son, and to all his servants that they should kill David. So now Saul came up publicly. First, he tried to kill David by pinning him to the wall. He couldn't work. He tried to send him to war so that he would be killed. It didn't work. And now, the next thing he said is, hey, you guys, now I'm, I'm tired of this David. You got to kill him. So he told Jonathan, his son, and he, all his servants that, go kill David. This is the command I gave you. But Jonathan saw son delighted much in David. And Jonathan told David, saying, Saul, my father, seeks to kill thee. Now, therefore, I pray thee, take heed to thyself until the morning, and abide in a secret place, and hide thyself. So Jonathan came that, hey, Paul has, Saul has given a command that you should be killed. So go and hide yourself. And I'm going to see if I can work things out for you. So let's go to the next verse. And I'll go out and stand beside my father in the field where thou art, and I'll continue with my father on thee. And what I see that I will tell thee. Next verse, please. And Jonathan spoke good of David unto his father and said unto him, Let not the king sin against the servant against David, because he has not sinned against thee, and because his works have been to thee what very good. And the next verse. For he had put his life in his hand and slew the Philistines, and the Lord wrought a great salvation for Israel. Thou sowest it, and did rejoice. Wherefore then wilt thou sin against innocent blood to slay David without a cause? So here Jonathan is trying to convince the father that, what has this guy done to you? This is a guy who faced Goliath when everybody was afraid, when nobody could go. He killed them, and Goliath, and when he did that, you were happy. Why do you want to kill him? He hasn't done anything. He hasn't offended you. 
If you kill him, you spill innocent blood, and that brings curses. So why do you want to do that? Um, let's go to the next verse. And Saul hearkened unto the voice of Jonathan, and Saul swore, as the Lord liveth, he shall not be slain. So Jonathan thought he had succeeded. He was able to convince the father to spare David. So, and as it is to make it more serious, they swear to God that we are not going to do that anymore. So once he did that, Jonathan knew that, okay, um, the problem is resolved. Let's go to the next verse then. And Jonathan called David, and Jonathan showed him all those things. And Jonathan brought David to Saul, and he was in the presence as in times past. So now, Saul has come back, and uh, David has come back to the presence of Saul to play the harp for Saul again. But as we see from the next verse, that he wasn't satisfied. He was still interested in killing David. So verse 8, and Jonathan called, no, verse 8. And there was war again, and David went out and fought with the Philistines and slew them with a great slaughter, and they fled before him, the next verse. And the evil spirit from the Lord was upon Saul as he sat in his house with his javelin in his hand, and David played with his hand. So David was in front of Saul, just playing again to smooth him again. Um, we see the next verse, what will happen. And Saul sought to smite David even to the wall with the javelin. But he slipped away out of Saul's presence, and he smote the javelin into the wall. And David fled and escaped that night. Next verse. And Saul sent messengers unto David's house to watch him and to slay him in the morning. And Michal, David's wife, told him, saying, If thou save not thy life tonight, Tomorrow thou shalt be slain. So here, after he'd been escaping, now Saul was, man, this guy has to die. David went to the wife, I mean, he went to his house, and I think news has come up that, hey, the king wants to kill David. Tomorrow he'll be dead. So what did the wife do? The wife told her, she got to leave now, now, now. Otherwise, you'll be a dead meat. <laughs> so what did the wife do? The next verse, let's go on. So Michal let David down through a window, and he went and fled and escaped. So he dropped David down through a window, which means their, door must, their window must have been probably by the wall or something like that. So, and it wasn't guarded. So David went down and left. So what was Saul doing? Next? He still sent, um, and the, the lady, what did the lady do? And Michal took an image and laid it in the bed and put a pillow of goat's hair on his bolster and covered it with a cloth. So this is where Saul's diabolical um, idea comes in. The image that the wife put there, David's wife put there, is called teraphim, and that is the word they are using in, um, in the Hebrew. It's an idol. And it was a special, a special idol. It was more or less a family idol, which was used. And it was used for divination and for more or less worship and enchantment and other things. And it is known that it was used to promote fertility. So it was sort of a god. So you see that Mecca was really an idol worshiper. And David, uh, Saul thought, if I make David, the wife of this my daughter, surely the daughter is going to leave David astray. And if David goes astray, he's dead because there's no way that God will be with him. And if God is not with David, that's the end of the show. So he was planning everything. And if we look at Ezekiel, Ezekiel made mention of uh, the Babylonians using this teraphim. And Ezekiel said, for the king of Babylon stand at the pattern of the way, at the head of the two ways, to use divination. He shakes the arrow, he consoles the idol, which is the teraphim, he looks at the liver, which means that was the means that they used for incantation and trying to get directions from it. So pure idol worshiping, and also Josiah, eventually Josiah in 2 Kings 23, 24, don't bother to put it there. Did the same thing. What he did was he removed the teraphim from Israel. The word of says, God says, Moreover, Joshua put away the mediums and the necromancers, 
and the household god, that is the teraphims and idols, and all the abominations that were seen in the land of Judah in Jerusalem, that he might establish the word of the law that were written in the book of Hilkiah, the priest found in the house of the Lord. So this was a household although they were using, and um, those who didn't, who claimed to be Israelites, but really were idol worshippers. And Saul thought that was a very nice way of getting David down for. So he was planning everything. But as we know that if God is with you, as the devil is trying all his tricks, God will use it in one way or the other also for help. So instead of using that idol um, behavior to ensnare David, what did the woman do? He used it as a, what I, what I say, a decoy. Is that the word, Marcus? Okay, as a decoy. So they came the next day that he told that David was sick. So they went back to Saul, said David is sick. And let's see what another verse so I say, hey, he's sick. Now I got him. Bring him to me. Now I'm going to kill him right now. If he's sick, he can't run away from me. He can't escape. So the, Saul sent the messengers again to, to see David, saying, bring him unto me in bed, that I may slay him. So he said, just take his bed and bring him right to me. This time I'm going to kill him because now I get a guy. This guy is sick. Oh, thank God. And it's this Monday. So let's see what happened. And when the messengers were come in, behold, there was an image. There was a teraphim in the bed with a pillow of goat's hair for his bolster. Then that's verse. And Saul said unto Michael, Why hast thou deceived me so and sent away my enemy that he escaped? So Saul was now so mad at the daughter. What is this? Why have you just deceived me like that and allowed David to go? You know what? I want to kill the guy. And Micah answered Saul. He said unto me, let me go. Why should I kill thee? So the lady had to lie because um, that he, you know what? The guy said, if I, I don't allow him to go, he's going to kill me. So I just let him go. And she spared her life also because, um, so we see what is happening. Jealousy is started just by people praising David more than Saul. Not that they didn't praise him, they praised him also because he was a king. But he was so jealous that he wanted to kill David. He planned all the things he was doing, even things that in the face of it looks like he was doing good. Behind it, he had plans that he, was, he wanted to eliminate David. He tried himself with a spear. It, or javelin didn't work. He tried the Philistines, it didn't work. And now, tried to use the daughter and the idol worshipping, it didn't work. And David went away. So, this time when David left, he went to Samuel. And that is what David did. He ran away to Samuel at Ramah. Ramah is about three miles away from Gibeah, so he went there. And what happened? Saul decided to chase him over there. So the first thing that he did was somebody told him that, hey, David, that you want, he's with Samuel in Ramah. So David sent, well, Saul sent messengers three different times to go and kill, bring David so that he would kill him. So it means the man meant business. It wasn't a joke anymore. He was serious to eliminate David. The first group of people went. And when they went, um, someone uh, so, uh, was taking David to a special place where the prophets were. So when they went, instead of going to search for David and kill David, or bring him down to be killed, the Spirit of God fell upon them, and they started prophesying. He did that three times. And Saul said, come on, look at this useless guy. Let me go myself and get him. Now nobody. So Saul went himself. And if we look at verse 19, let's say 22. Then went he also to Ramah, that is Saul, and came to a great well that is in Seku. 
And he asked and said, Where are Samuel and David? And one said, Behold, they be now in Ramah. And he went thither to Naioth in Ramah, and the Spirit of the Lord fall upon him also. And he went on and prophesied until he came to Naioth in Ramah. So what happened here? On the way, when even they told him, when he was going to the place, the special place where Samuel and David were, the Holy Spirit fall, fell upon him and he started prophesying. And let's see what happened next. And he stripped off his clothes also and prophesied before Samuel like a man and lay down naked all that day and all that night. Wherefore, they say he saw also among the prophets. So when he got close, you know God is so wonderful, he used various means. He got hold of him, the Holy Spirit came upon him, and this time he couldn't do anything. He had to fall down, take his clothes. Um, the word of God says naked. Some people say he's not naked, naked. But it doesn't matter whether naked, naked or not. Okay. <laughs> he lied down and started prophesying to us. So he couldn't carry out his mission. I'm sure David left from that point because of, of this. He gave David a chance to leave. And then... People were then saying, wow, how can we so, so be among the prophets? So here there's one lesson that we, we can learn, and that is um, spirituality. Um, if the word spirituality, being a strong Christian doesn't depend on what we call spiritual gifts or charismatic gifts. That is not what it is. Saul was prophesying all along, so if you see somebody maybe prophesying that or speaking in tongues but more than anything. That doesn't mean he's more spiritual than you. That doesn't mean that a person is closer to God more than you. If we look at Jesus' teaching, what did Jesus say? He said, if you love me, you obey me. So obedience is more or less the yastic of who is a strong Christian. So if you obey God, that is, it's, not, it's not a gift that the Holy Spirit has given you because those things were just, are just, really it's not you, it's God doing it. So if we have those gifts, we should not think that we are more important than others. Than others. And those who don't have should not think that they are inferior because in God's sight, if we love him, it's a matter of obedience. It's not a matter of gifts. So this is a lesson. Saul was really evil in that sense, trying to eliminate David. But in that process, he was prophesying. Um, he might have been saying good things. So one thing that we can say is jealousy can lead us to a very serious... Um, we, it blinds people in such a way that even when we are committing sin, devising evil, we, don't, we can't think of it. We just keep on, keep on. So jealousy is something that we should guard against as Christians, that we should make sure that we shouldn't move in that track. If for some reason we find ourselves jealous of someone or somebody, we should go to God to help us overcome it. If we get blinded by jealousy, like so, we will pursue evil after evil, and that will not end well. Um, another thing also that comes in is we should always rely on the law for our protection, if we do that, because there are so many things which we don't know he knows, and if we rely on him, what we have to keep our focus on is to do the work that God has assigned to us. If we keep on doing it, God will do his part. He will protect us because he is our shield and he is our protector. And when this happened, um, this incident happened, we are looking at all this, but something also beautiful came through it. That, that is when we understand that David wrote the Psalm 59. So let us see what Psalm 59 tells us. Um, let's see. It says, deliver me from my enemies. This could be a prayer if we are facing um, difficult times. Um, let's move back, please, one more. Um, David, I move back, not forward. Deliver me from my enemies, O oh my God. Defend me from them that rise up against me. So when trouble comes, this is a type of prayer that we can pray. 
we should call on God to deliver us. And if we go to the verse 2, it says, Deliver me from the workers of iniquity and save me from blood testament. So again, we should call on the Lord for deliverance. And looking at the next verse, it says, For lo, they lie in wait for my soul. The mighty are gathered against me, not for my transgressions, nor for my sin, O Lord. So once we are innocent, knowing that God has forgiven us of our sins, when evil is coming against us, what we should do is we should call on the Lord for deliverance. When we go to verse 4, it says, They run and prepare themselves without my fault. Awake to me and behold. The next verse. Thou therefore, O Lord God of hosts, the God of Israel, awake to visit all the heathen. Be not merciful to any wicked transgressors. So here David is saying, the Lord, don't listen to them. Come up and do not have mercy upon them because they want to kill me. Um, let's move on. When we are praying this time, maybe this part should be modified a bit because of the fact that Jesus said that we should not curse our enemies. So we should, this is a balance that we have to take care of. When we are reading the Old Testament, certain things which are said in the New Testament, uh, we've been given different commandments. So we, we can pray in that line, but you can still modify it a bit not to go um, in the wrong direction. They return at evening, they make a noise like a dog, and they go around about the city. And going to the next verse, it says, Behold, they belch out with their mouth, salts are in their lips. For who say they do it here? Let's see the next one. But thou, O Lord, shall love at them, that thou shalt have all the heaven in derision. So here David is saying, yes, they are going about, but I know that you are my God. You are going to throw them in disarray. They will not succeed. And if we go on, because of his strength, will I wait upon thee, O God, is my defense. So we should know that as children of God, God is our defense. If the storms of life are coming against us, we should always remember that we are children of God, so our defense comes from God. And that is what David, David wrote this, going through all these issues for us to know probably how to pray when in times of hardship. And if we move on to the next verse, um, do something for me. Flow with me when I finish. Just move to the next, even if I'm commenting. The God of my mercy shall prevent, prevent me God shall let me see my desires upon my enemies. So David was saying that God will deliver me, and in this sense, he said that he will punish my enemies. As God says, vengeance is mine, says the Lord, I repay. Slay them not, lest my people forget. Scatter them by thy power, and bring them down, O Lord, our shall. So here, if it in praying that God should eliminate them, David is saying that don't kill them. Just disgrace them so that everybody will see what is going on. For the sin of their mouth and the words of their lips, let them be taken in their pride and for cursing and lying which they speak. So David was still play, praying, saying that God, you see my enemies trying to kill me. Don't allow them to do that. Deliver me because you are my defense. And as we are doing that, by the way, don't kill them. Just spare their life. Just disgrace them so that all will know. Um, consume them in a wrath. Consume them that they may not be. And let them know that God ruleth in Jacob unto the ends of the earth. Sailor. So David here is saying that, Lord, as you are doing this, let it be to show your glory. Let your glory show forth. It's not the vengeance that I'm looking for. I want your glory to come forth. So that is so wonderful that somebody who's praying to God, seeking God's help, that his enemies will not succeed against him. And even that, he's looking at God. Whatever you do, do it in such a way that you'll be glorified, not that uh, I'll be happy or whatever it is. Um, and if we move on, he says, and that even let them return and let them make a noise like a dog and go around about the city. 
Let's go to the next verse. And let them wander up and down for meat and grudge if they be not satisfied. But I will sing of thy power, yea, I will sing aloud of thy mercy in the morning, for thou hast been my defense and refuge in the day of trouble. So God is our defense, God is our refuge. Even if there's any trouble, that is God is in control. Unto thee, O my strength, will I sing for God is my defense and the God of my mercy. Amen. So here, with all this trouble David went through, look at the wonderful psalm he wrote. Something for us to use in prayer to help us in our lives. May the Lord bless his word in Jesus' name. <laughs> so, one thing I want you to note that if your husband is doing something or your daughter is doing something, you begin to hate and bitter towards them. And you don't let go and forgive as a child of God is supposed to. You, you become vulnerable to evil spirits to begin to use you in the house. Please. Saul took a javelin to try to drive it through David and kill him. That is why sometimes, if you're not careful, a little thing in the family, if you don't control it, you might want to even kill your spouse or your children. You may not want anything good to come your way just because of something that they have done and you don't like it. I want these messages to be real to us. It's not, it, this is not fantasy. Spiritual. And I want you to think about it carefully. Children, love your parents. Parents, love your children. Let us not provoke each other unto anger or wrath. But let everything we do generate the love and joy in the family. Forgive one another. Hallelujah. I believe God gave Saul so many opportunities to turn around, but he was so determined. First time, second time, third time, the fourth time, the fifth time. It seems like he became blind, like we told in the, in the sermon. When you, are, when you despise people, you become blind spiritually. So everything in you is going to drive you to want to hurt, harm that person. Please, let's begin. It's the same charity begins what? at home. This is my greatest burden for the church. And I want, that's why every time I preach, I like to make it practical. Because it's not meant for somebody outside of this place. It's meant for us to transform us into the image of Christ. Hallelujah. <laughs>